record. <laughs> so this does say kites, um, six, section 6.5, so we could put a, like a B in there if you want, B, because this is like the second part of section 6.5. The first part was what? What was the first thing that we talked about in the section? Not just diagonals. It was more general. What was it about? What figure? What polygon? What kind of polygon? Trapezoids. trapezoids thank you. All right, so it was trapezoids. So the title of this section was Trapezoids and Kites. We didn't quite finish the last thing about trapezoids on Friday, so let's do that right now. And uh, so let's draw a trapezoid. Yep. Now, this does not, I think the last thing we talked about was this specifically was an isosceles trapezoid. Uh, this right here, what we're going to do now does not have to be an isosceles trapezoid. I mean, it could be, but it's not. It doesn't have to be. Let me start here, and let's go about like this. All right, and connect this. There we go. All right, so we got a trapezoid. Just any old ordinary run-of-the-mill trapezoid. It's not isosceles. This side right here is definitely longer than this side. Would you agree? Okay, the base angles are not equal to each other. When are the base angles equal to each other? When it's a isosceles trapezoid, okay? So these are not equal, these are not equal, these two sides are not equal, but it is a trapezoid, so what must be true about it? Parallel. Right, these two parallel. sides, what, one set, very good, one set of parallel lines, and I made these two right here the parallel ones. All right, so we got a trapezoid. Now we have a thing, and we've talked about this on a triangle, but this is the first time they've talked about it, I believe, on a trapezoid, and we're gonna talk about the mid-segment. Do you remember that? Mid-segment of a triangle? but we're not gonna do mid-segment of a triangle, we're gonna do mid-segment of a what? Trapezoid. Okay, I'll just put trap. All right, so what do you think the mid-segment is? It's gonna take the two non-parallel sides. Everybody hear me? The two non-parallel sides, and if you find the, what do you think? The midpoint of those, let's see, where would it be? About right there? Does that look like the midpoint? No, it looks a little low, doesn't it? Does that look it? It's pretty close. All right, you come over here and you find the midpoint of this one. Again, I'm just eyeballing it. Does that look pretty close? Kind of. Let's do this in a different color. So, if I connect the midpoints, something special happens. It was pretty close. I'll tell you what, let's put that little dot about right there, okay? All right, so now, Let's take a look. See this yellow one right there? That is the midpoint. So let's label this A, B, C, D. And we'll call this M and N right there. M and N. All right. And uh, let's see. We'll call, since this is a base, the two parallel sides are the bases, let's just call this B1 and B2. Is that all right? And since this is the mid-segment, what do you think I'm going to call that whole entire mid-segment? I, I could call it line segment MN. I could have called this AB, but I don't know. It's just a little easier if you write it like this. So what do you, what do you think I'll call the, this? It's mid-segment. So if I call the bases B1 and B2, what do you think I'm going to call the, right, just call that M1. All right? Okay. Now watch. So look. Just by looking at it, now this is not a proof, I'm just trying to get you to look at it and say, you know what, I think this is probably true, and it will be, all right, I promise. What do you think is true about MN compared to the other two parallel sides? It's parallel, that's right. All three of these are parallel. So the mid-segment of a trapezoid is parallel to the two bases. Everybody hear that? And that's one of our theorems. It's actually called, Lo and behold, the trapezoid mid-segment theorem. I'm not going to write that down, but you can. It's in the book. It says the mid-segment of a trapezoid is parallel to the bases, right, or the two parallel sides. Those would be the bases. Everybody with me on that? So I could say what? I could say MN is parallel to what? Okay, to DC. Let's do the top one first. Is that all right? Actually, let's put a little line segment over top of it. So line segment MN is parallel to line segment AB, which is also what? Parallel to line segment DC, all right? So that's the first thing, okay? That's the first thing. There's two things that we know about the mid-segment. That's the first one. 
And that's pretty obvious, wouldn't you think? Yeah, that's pretty obvious that they would be parallel to each other. But there's a second thing that's true about the mid-segment of a trapezoid, all right? And it may not quite be, so, it be quite so obvious to you, all right? But I'll just show it to you. Again, there's proofs for this. We're not going to go through the proof. Just accept it as true, okay? Um, but if you want, I think they might do the proof in the book. I'm not really sure. But you could always look it up. I'm sure nobody will, but that's okay. Um, let's take a look. Uh, look at the length of. Now, right here, this is not the length. That's why I put that little line segment over top of it. What if I put the length of a line segment? What would I put? I wouldn't put anything over top of it, right? I'd put just MN. But I made this a little easier, and you could have done this. You could have said that B1, right, is parallel to M1, which is also parallel to B2, if you wanted to, just to make it a little easier, all right? What about this, though, MN, the length of it? The length of MN compared to the length of AB and DC. Do you think it's equal to AB? No. Do you think it's equal to DC? Do you think it's twice as big? Do you think it's half as big? Do you think what? I say, I say DC is, AB is two-thirds Let's say B1, B2, M1, just to make it easier. B1 is two-thirds of B2. Okay, that's a good choice because, you know, we did that whole, uh, what was that, the end center when it was two-thirds, okay? But it's not. Well, I'll tell you what it is. This M1 right here, or MN, okay, it's the average of the two parallel sides. <laughs> kind of. Okay, so what does that mean, the average? If I was going to write it out, write out a little formula. So M1, the length of M1 is equal to, how do you find the average of two things? Add them up and divide by two. So what do you think our little formula is going to be here? So you add what up? Yep, you add the B1 and the B2, and you divide it by 2. There it is. Okay? I don't think you did this in Algebra 1. But you did average. I'm sure you talked about average. Okay? Everybody looking here? Shh. Guys, come on, come on. So let's take a look. So how do I find the mid-segment? I take the average of the two bases, or I just add up the two bases and divide it by 2. Everybody see that? So now, let's do an example. Um, tell you what, let's do this in a different color. I'll just use the same picture instead of having to draw another picture. But What's B divided by 2? I don't know. I don't know what you're... I got a B1 and a B2. And the reason I use 1 and 2 is because they're bases. Because they're bases. Yeah, absolutely. That's what we've been doing all year, right? We've been, we've been doing this all year. All right, so let's say, let's say the mid-segment was 10, all right? And, oh, here, got it right in front of me. And this is 4x plus, they use r, I don't know why they use r, but that's an x. They say that ab or b1 was 4x plus 2, and then this bottom one is 2x, okay? And they want you to find the length of ab and the length of dc, okay? Good idea, okay? So we've been doing all year, right? Solving for x first, right? Put it into a little algebra formula, doing some algebra, solve for x, plug it back in, right? This is not our first rodeo, is it? We've been doing this a lot this year. And I told you, when we first did that, I said, we're gonna be doing this the rest of the year. And was, have I been right so far? Absolutely. All right, so how do we do this? Well, let's use this formula right here. Let's use the formula. So what is the M1? Huh? 72? Give me a number. It's 10. Right. It's 10. All right. Equals B1 plus B2. So you add up the two bases. So let's add up the two bases. What are they? Yeah, you could just do it in your head if you wanted to, but I'm going to write it down just so everybody knows where we get that from. And then what do you do with that? Divided by 2. So what did I just do? I added the two bases together and divided by 2. So this is the average, isn't it? But the average actually comes out to a 10. Does that mean this is necessarily 5 and 5? No, because look, that's shorter than that. So we got to figure out, you know, what it is, all right, to figure out what the average is. All right? So let's do the math. Here we go. So 10 equals, what am I going to do here? I'm just going to add up some like terms. So that's 6x plus 2. 
Jack already did that in his head, put it there, and you could if you want to. I just wrote it out so you could see it. Now let's do some math. This is a little bit different than what we've done this year, but it's basic algebra one stuff. So I gotta get x by itself. What am I gonna get rid of first? Which two? The two on the bottom, very good. So let's get rid of this two on the bottom. It's being divided, good. See, Mr. Cheadle taught you. So you divided by two, so you multiply by two to get rid of it, agreed? So that two and that two go. Everybody with me on that? Now, if you wanted to, I wouldn't do this, but if you wanted to, this 6x plus 2 was all being divided by 2, right? So you could have gone 6x divided by 2, which is 3x, but then you'd have to also go 2 divided by 2, which is what? 1. So you could have, if you wanted to, made this 3x plus 1 and then solve for it, all right? That would have been fine, too. But you're going to find out in algebra, it's not always going to both divide out nice and even like that, okay? So I would get rid of the denominator. That's what I would do, all right? So what do we got? We got 20 equals 6x plus 2. Let's do the math. Now it's super easy. Let's do this in our head. Subtract a 2, which gives you 18 equals 6x. And then x is 3, all right? But is that my answer? Is that what I asked for? I know I didn't write it down, but I didn't ask for x. I asked to find the what? The lengths of AB and DC, all right? So that's what I'm... Or you could say B1 and B2, either one. So what I just say X was? Three? All right, so let's put it in here. Let's do this in our head. Four times three, which is, plus two is? 12 plus two? Okay. I know you're just playing around, I hope. All right, put a three in for this. What's that? It's six. That's that one. Do they average to be 10? Sure. 14 and 6 is 20, right? Divided by 2 is 10, all right? So that's how you do it. It's pretty easy, isn't it? Now that's trapezoids. But today's lesson, that was just left over from Friday, just because we didn't quite finish it. So, oh, I got rid of everything. Ah. Let's just do this. Let's do this. Let's select it all. Let's do that, and let's do that. There we go, now we're good to go. All right, now, you guys love kites so much, so now we're gonna, do, we're gonna talk about some kites. All right. Yeah, these aren't flying dragon kites though. These are your basic <laughs> everyday kind of quadrilateral kite. All right, we got some theorems. I'm not gonna write the words down to the theorem just because of time, but I'll just write theorem and then we'll show a picture, we'll describe what it says, okay? But you probably should. I wrote it down in my notes, okay? So you should write it down in your notes. I just wanna conserve some time here, so I'm not gonna write them down. Here's what it says. Well, let's, I'll tell you what, let's draw a kite first. Guys, let's listen, please. Now, I'm just eyeballing this. I could take some time to make it a little more accurate, but um, not going to. <laughs> All right. I'm going to do this. Yeah, that's really bad, isn't it? That's pretty, that's pretty close. So I'm going to go here. Guys, again, I've say, I say this every time. I don't know why you don't understand and you just take it to heart. If I'm sitting here trying to draw something, figure something out, this is not a time for you to have little conversations like this, okay? Just sit and watch. Just because I'm not actively teaching and talking to you doesn't mean it's a free time for you to do whatever you want to do. All right, so I'm going to get rid of this one in the middle just to, because we don't, well, actually, no, not, not yet. All right, let's take a look. So it is a kite. So by definition of a kite, we have these two consecutive, right? It's got two pairs of consecutive sides that are equal to each other. So these two are equal to each other. They're consecutive. They're right next to each other, agreed? And then this one and this one, okay? So by definition, that's a kite right there. It's a quadrilateral 
two sets of two consecutive sides equal to each other or congruent, however you want to say it. Now, here's what our theorem says. This is not the theorem. This thing right here is just our definition of a kite. But here's what our theorem says. And I'll put the stuff in blue for the theorem. It says, exactly one pair of opposite angles in a kite are congruent. It says exactly one pair. So only one. So which one do you think it is? It's the angle between the two sides that are not equal to each other. Okay? Do you see everybody see that? See the two sides that are not equal to each other? The angle that forms those two? Those are the ones they're gonna those two angles right there are gonna be equal. If you look at this one, this goes a lot wider than this one right here, doesn't it? That angle. All right. Now, there is a way to prove this. So we don't do a ton of proofs in here. We have from time to time. But let me just put a blue line right there, just to help us out a little bit. Now, check this out. By putting a line in the middle right here, I have two triangles. By putting a line right down the middle like this, I have two triangles. What do you think might be true about these two triangles? Forget the blue right now, okay? We're trying to figure out if those two blue angles are actually equal to each other, okay? That's what we're trying to figure out, all right? But look at this. I got two triangles. What do you think is true about those two triangles? Uh, we don't say equal. What do we say? They're congruent to each other. Why are they congruent? Give me a reason why they're congruent to each other. Side angle side? Side side side. Where's the third side? I got one side, two sides. Yeah, this one right here. And we say that this is equal. We say that this side on this triangle is equal to this side on this triangle because of the reflexive property. If we would have been doing um, proofs all year long, that would have been stuck in your head, I'm sure, because we use that a lot. But it's called the reflexive property. So these two triangles are congruent because of side, side, side. Now remember, if the triangles are congruent, the angles that match up, we call those the corresponding angles, those angles must be equal to each other as well. So if you look at this, let's um, put some letters in here. I should have done that earlier. W, X, Y, and Z. All right? So these two triangles, if I took those two triangles and folded them on top of each other, what angles would be equal to each other? Well, this angle right here would be equal to this angle right here. Would you agree? Yes. Okay. We had a reason for this. I don't know if you remember. Again, I decided, and I don't know if I should have or not, for the, I think maybe next year, if I teach honors again, I think I will do the proofs, and I probably just won't do them for the CP class. So, um, but... Uh, these are equal because, do you remember this? Corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. I don't remember that. I never, I never did that in here? Wow. Maybe I did this in the, uh, I did this in the uh, CP class. Okay. And I did this in the CP class. So watch. Corresponding parts. What does that mean? That means when you take the two... So when you have two triangles and they're congruent to each other, okay, if I laid one right on top of the other, okay, it means all those parts that match up, they're called corresponding parts, okay? So if you have tr congruent triangles and you were to, if you took this and right folded it in half, would you agree where that blue line is? All the parts that match up would be equal to each other. So this angle and this angle are corresponding to each other. So if they're corresponding parts, and their congruent triangles, what must be true about those two corresponding parts? They must be what? Congruent. So here's what this says. I'm not going to write it out, but this first C means corresponding parts of what? Congruent triangles are congruent. Okay? You understand what that means? So if I take two triangles, put them right on top of each other, all the stuff that matches up, sign, please. Say it again. If I have two triangles that are congruent to each other and the parts that match up, right, the parts that, you know, right on top of each other like that, they must be congruent as well. So these two angles would match up, wouldn't they? What other angles would match up? Well, this one and this one would match up. So they would be equal to each other, wouldn't they? And why would they be equal to, to each other? Because corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. What else would be equal to each other? 
this one and this one right here. Why would they be equal to each other? Because corresponding parts are congruent, triangles are congruent, okay? And a lot of times we just say CPCTC, all right? Anyway, just thought I'd throw that in there. So that's why this first theorem is true. That's why that um, one pair of opposite angles in a kite are congruent. And so angle X would equal angle Z. So angle X would equal angle Z. Okay, that's what we know by that theorem, that first theorem. It doesn't have a special name, they just call it a theorem. Okay, enough of that. Let's, um, let's do another one. Let's draw another kite. I'm gonna draw it just a little bit different to show you that kites don't always have to go like left and right like that did. All right, so let's draw one like this. Again, I'm just gonna eyeball it. I could probably copy and paste it and rotate it and all that kind of stuff, but is that pretty close? Close enough. All right, and then I'm gonna draw this middle line just so I know where to attach the next one. And we give a name for that middle line that I drew right there. We're going to talk about that here in a second. All right, so there's a kite. And what do we know about this kite? We know by definition, since it's a kite, that this side and this side are equal, and this side and this side are equal. And we know by the theorem that this angle right here is equal to this angle right here. Agreed? So if I drew this thing right here, do you see this? Uh, let's call it, they actually call it kite. K-I-T-E. Okay. So they give this name, this IE right here, this one that goes down the middle, they give it a name and they call it the axis of symmetry. It's weird, isn't it? So axis of symmetry. What in the world does symmetry mean? Yeah, it's kind of what it means, okay? Like if I take this triangle and I fold it in half, that means the left side and the right side are gonna be exactly the same, it's symmetric. Everybody see that? We talk about that in photography sometimes when you take a picture. Um, the left side and the right side are exactly the same. So look, this side right here, this triangle and this triangle are exactly the same. So this is the line that divides it to make the left side and the right side exactly the same. Does that make sense? All right, so we call this the axis of symmetry. Okay, the axis just meaning basically a line that makes this symmetric. All right, so that's the axis of symmetry. They give you another word. I've never seen this in a um, geometry text, but they call this KT. They call, I'll tell you what, um, I'll put this in parentheses. So IE would be the axis of symmetry and the KT, they give it a name, they call it the crossbar. That kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Okay, it's going across like this. Okay, they call it the crossbar. I've never seen that before. I don't know if it's just this book that calls it that, but anyway, that's what this book calls it. And it's good to give it a name, all right? Everybody with me? So here's, you got a couple theorems. You got two different theorems. Here's what the first one says, okay? I'll just put theorem, I'm not gonna write it out. We'll just describe it and then say what's equal or whatever is here. It says the diagonals of a kite. So these two lines that we just drew, they would be considered diagonals, wouldn't they? Go from one vertex to another, right? And they're non-consecutive. Yeah, we've talked about diagonals a lot. So these are the diagonals, those two lines right there, the axis of symmetry and the crossbar. It says the diagonals of a kite are, now again, just by eyeballing it and looking at it, what do you think is possibly true about the diagonals? Uh, they don't bisect. Look, that, that's a lot shorter than that one right there. So they don't necessarily bisect, get him? They gotta be what? You faded out there. It's half. Well, that is true, and you're gonna see that in a second. That's the next theorem, but you're absolutely right, okay, that this crossbar is cut in half by the axis of symmetry. So that's good, that's one part of it. Alex, what do you think? They're perpendicular, okay? That's the first thing, all right? So they're perpendicular, which means it's a right angle. So that's what the first theorem says. So basically, the first theorem basically says that line segment KT is perpendicular to line segment IE, IE, all right? So that's what the first theorem says. Now the second theorem, yep, 
The second theorem says what Gideon said, all right, is that this axis of symmetry bisects, he didn't say bisect, but he said cut it in half, which is the same thing. It bisects KT. Everybody see that? So how can I write that? Uh, let's, put, let's put an X in there for that point right there. All right, so what must be true? If this KT is being bisected, what can you say? You can say that KX is what? No. Give me a, a length. Compare it to another length. KX is, you could say it's half a KT. You could, but what would be better than that? It's equal to. That's right. So watch. I'll put a three here. See this little segment right here and this one right here? Then they are congruent to each other. All right. So we could call it XT or let's call it TX. All right. And I'm not going to put anything over top of it because if I put it equals, that means the length of KX and the length of TX are equal to each other. Make sense? All right, here's another thing. Um, yeah, let's do this. Look at these little two triangles up here. What do you think might be true about this triangle and this triangle? Cam, I'm up here. They're congruent to each other. Give me a reason why they're congruent to each other. Well, since you know that these two are equal, yeah, you could say side, side, side. Or if you wanted to, since it was a right triangle, you could say hypotenuse leg. Do you remember hypotenuse leg from way back? Okay. So either way, these triangles are congruent to each other. Agreed? All right. So if they're congruent to each other, what do you think is true about this little angle and this angle right here? They're equal to each other. Okay. So you could write that down. You could say that angle, what do you call it? K-I-X, if you want to call it that. K, K I X or K I E, it doesn't matter how, what you call it, is equal to what? K I X. I'm going to go T I X, angle T I X. All right, so they're equal to each other. What else do you think is equal to each other on here? What about this angle down here? Right, and this one right here. Okay, they're going to be equal to each other as well. So what are we going to call this? K E X, so angle K E X would be equal to angle what, T-E-X? All right. So that's a lot of stuff, isn't it? Yep, tex kex. All right. Everybody got that? All right, let's do an example and we'll be done. Uh, I don't know, can I, can I draw this? Hit shift. Copy it. So I'm just going to copy and paste. There we go. And uh, I should have copied the um, axis of symmetry as well. There's that. There's that. All right. So we got the same kite. Again, uh, we'll call it K I T E. Just they did that in the book. K I T E. And again, they call that X, you know, it's perpendicular, you know, this and this are equal, you know, this and this are equal. And we could keep going and mark all the stuff, but here's what they tell you. They tell you a couple things and then you got to find something, all right? We've got about four minutes, so let, I think we can do this quick. Uh, they tell you that XKE, this one right here is 55 degrees. Oops, come on. 55 degrees. That's this angle right there. Okay, and that's it. That's basically all they tell you. Okay. All right. Let's see if we can find some stuff. Yeah, let's. I tell you what. Let's keep it in the middle where it was. Uh, there we go. Instead of me writing them out, just because. We're strapped on time right here. Um, let's see what we could figure out. KTE. KTE. Where's KTE? KTE. That's this angle right there. That would be 55 as well, because these are congruent triangles, right? And they're corresponding parts, right? Of congruent triangles. So that's 55 degrees. Or you could do it a little easier than that. You're, you are right. You could do that. But since this is a right triangle, you're always going to take 90 away from 180, aren't you? Yes. 
So if it's a right triangle, instead of adding them up and taking away from 180, right, why not just take 55 away from 90, right? And that would be 35. So this angle right there would be 35, and this angle right there would be 35 degrees, okay? Now, is there any way to be able to tell what this angle right here is? There's, is there? Yeah, they do. But does that help you find that, though? Because I don't know what this is. No, no. We never said that this and this are equal to each other. We never said that this crossbar bisects that angle. Okay? You can't. There's nothing you can do. Okay? We're running out of time, so I'll just tell you right now. All right? So you cannot figure out what this angle is because you don't know the whole big angle. What if I knew that whole big angle K? Then you would take 55 away from it, but I don't know it. So really, there's nothing else that I could find here. Uh, they do ask for angle KET. Well, we, that's easy. What's KET equal to? Uh, 70. 70, right. KET is this angle right there. Okay, that's 70, all right? So you got your little uh, lesson plan thing, right? I'm just going to write it down so we can see it on YouTube. So it's section 65, page 280, 1 to 12. All right, there it is, 1 to 12 tonight.